Thank you very much. Cities use more than 75% of the world's energy and generate more than 75% of its greenhouse gases. Buildings are often the largest energy users. On Tuesday, at a press conference for the Large Cities Climate Summit, Bill Clinton announced a new plan to fight global warming through an international partnership between city mayors, large banks, and members of the construction and energy industries. More often than not, however, it's expensive to take an existing building and make the improvements that will bring about the energy savings. Today we announce a program to perform these improvements on a massive scale in 16 major cities around the world. The Clinton Climate Initiative aims to use economic incentives rather than laws and international treaties to persuade building owners in big cities to dramatically cut their energy use. The plan involves five major banks providing loans to landlords so they can retrofit older buildings with more energy efficient heating, cooling and lighting systems. Four major construction companies have signed on to the initiative. Under this new program, these companies have not only agreed to scale up their capacity to do large numbers of building retrofits around the world, but equally important, to provide financial performance guarantees on energy savings that will result from their retrofit projects. Well, it's good to see you, Mr. President. Thank um, you. Thanks for taking time to do this interview. Glad to do it. New York Times science reporter Andrew C. Revkin sat down with the former president to talk about the economics and politics of climate change. I get this impression that you're focused on um, concrete, achievable th things beyond sort of instruments and policies. Much of what we need to do is economical now if we can get organized and get after it. For example, you tell me which is more valuable uh, to take, forget about climate change. A uh, statement that says, we are going to reduce the AIDS death rate by 15% in the next 10 years. A statement. And then you have all these meetings and try to figure out how you're going to do that. Or the establishment of the Global Fund on AIDS, TB, and Malaria, which actually provides funding to keep people alive and reduce the death rate. So I'm, it's fine to have these goals, but I'd like to see the international community focus on mechanisms. For example, if you look at what we did today, Arguably, the most important thing was to get the $5 billion in commitments from the financial institutions, which more than double the size of the market, and then get their, the commitment from the energy savers to offer performance guarantees, which then made it possible to finance repayment of the bank loans through energy savings, lower utility bills every month. And doing that is really, really important and maybe a lot more important than just stating we're going to have a goal here. We, you got to figure out how to get this stuff done. I, I like to get us back in the solutions business. On that score, there's, there's the, I've been writing a lot lately about this, uh, this sort of a climate divide out there. There's the rich countries that have created all the emissions that have led to the changes in climate that are already underway and the poor countries that have all these other priorities like poverty, inadequate water. Do you see the need to sort of integrate this into development policy more generally? In other words, Absolutely. I mean, because if they're, they're focused on, you know, sure. dirty water and, and all the other things. Uh, sure, we should be able to say to, uh, you know, let's suppose we're going to give uh, $50 million in development aid from the EU to Mozambique, a wonderful place where I work. We say, okay, we want this much for clean water, this much for sanitation, this much for, for uh, AIDS, TB, malaria, and all the health issues but we want to help you with buildings and we'll, we'll invest in your growth, but you have to agree to certain building standards, responsible materials, use of decentralized solar and wind energy, all that is sort of a clean strategy for the future. And if we do that, it can make a, a huge difference. I mean, the International Finance Corporation just gave some financing to a friend of mine down in the Dominican Republic who's building a big wind farm near the Haitian border and he wants to serve both Haiti and the Dominican Republic. That's the sort of thing we need to be doing more of. Some environmental campaigners I talked to are thrilled about the activity today, you know, Al Gore has, has pushed forward on and, and, and about your work too, but they still look back on the Clinton years and the, some of these campaigners are still frustrated by what hadn't happened then. And I don't know how much of that was a function of, well, you tell me, what's changed um, since then? Public attitudes have changed. 
and the price of oil is higher. I think that's helped. But a lot of it is what we know. I mean, when Al and I, you know, we supported that carbon tax in 93, you know, even our own party wouldn't stay with us in the Senate. And, you know, that, that's just where America was then, that they were trapped in the mindset of the old energy economy. But we have moved away from that quite rapidly. Uh, and I'm very encouraged by that. I think, you know, now we, we have a real shot to do something. Is there anything you could have done differently? Uh, I don't know. The two, I, I, maybe I should have focused less on um, transportation and electricity generation. Because what happened was the um, Detroit had a coalition of the UAW and the auto workers who didn't want to raise mileage standards. And uh, the coal guys didn't have, and we didn't have even a hint at that time that we could get serious about clean coal technology. And so it may be that uh, I should have started with the energy efficiency, with the low hanging fruit, and with the the research to try to lower the unit cost of solar and wind and then work back into the other issues. Um, and that might have made a difference. It just seems to be the perfect problem, meaning the perfectly worst problem, to, to either communicate, to legislate. It has the long time scale outcomes that always will have some uncertainty. In the political realm, how do you deal with that? The real challenge we face in the political realm is making this a voting issue. Like, we know, we now have a big majority of people who think that climate change is real. We have a big majority of people who favor some action on it. Uh, this is a voting issue in Europe. Can it be made a voting issue in America? I think the answer is yes, because we now know enough to know that the climate changes are already underway and they can't be good. And we know enough now to know that there are things we can do that will generate economic opportunity and reduce social inequality, and that can't be bad.